So you ever enrolled in a, in a biology class, and biology is all about the study of living things, right? So chapter one, we, you know, rightfully start talking about those things that make something a living thing. So uh, let's go through just some overall basic things that, uh, that make, come or make a, a living thing special. So first of all, the first life uh, formed about 3.5 billion years ago. It was single cell organisms, and they appeared first and they floated alone in the sea. Uh, there are about 40 million species, types of organisms, that exist and, uh, today. And of that 40 million, we only know about or have identified about 2 million of them. Now, for you people that you know like math, that's a 1 out of 20 ratio. So that means that 5% of all the species on the planet have been identified. 95% of not. So the real issue for me that I want you to think about is, uh, you know, we have 40 million species and 2 million of them that we know about, 38 million we don't. So every time we do something to our environment, such as, you know, uh, slash and burn farming, or we, we kill off environments of, of organisms, we have to understand that we could be eliminating one of those 38 million species that we didn't even know existed. And we'll talk about why that's a significant thing later. Um, many organisms are unidentified, and there are new species that are, are still being discovered. Uh, by definition, biology is the study of all living things and how they interact with each other and their environment. Over long periods of time, species changed or evolved so that new species arose from earlier organisms and came to inhabit almost every part of the Earth. This includes bacteria living in thermal vents, parasites that live inside of other organisms, etc., and uh, organisms have to adapt to a specific environment in order to survive and reproduce. And those organisms that are unable to do so will perish and become extinct. So in, bio so in biology, there are some unifying themes, six things that are in any biology class. So if you went over to Chelsea, took biology, you went over to, you know, Celine, took a biology class, these six things would be the foundation of any good introductory biology class. And those six things are as follows. Number one... There's always something about cell structure and function. Number two, it's always about stability and homeostasis. You're going to hear me talk about that word a lot, homeostasis. It's probably the most important thing in all of biology. Number three is reproduction and inheritance. Then number four is evolution. Number five is the interdependence of organisms on one another. And number six is matter, energy, and organization. So let's start talking about cell structure and function, give you a little bit of an overview. We will go over each of these significantly more. But basically, a cell is the basic unit of structure and function in living things. Uh, organisms can either be made up of one cell if they're unicellular, or can be multicellular. So below you see a unicellular amoeba, a one-celled organism. You are a multicellular organism. Cells are small. But they're highly organized, and they contain specialized structures that carry out the jobs of a cell called organelles. Now, this is only true if the type of cell is called a eukaryote, which we will cover in more in depth in the future. So, cellular organelles. There are many different types of cells, and, but they uh, all have some similar characteristics, and they also have, from time to time, some differences. You know, for example, animal cells and plant cells have some differences, like a, such as a cell wall or a chlorophyll and chloroplasts. Uh, all cells are surrounded by a cell membrane. Uh, they contain cytoplasm and have DNA. New cells made by unicellular organisms end up being identical clones to the parent. We're going to call that process mitosis. And it is said to be an asexual process. What is, anytime you put a in front of a word, it means the opposite of. So asexual reproduction is reproduction that does not require sexual reproduction. Uh, multicellular organisms begin life as one fertilized cell and then undergo a multiplication and a differentiation to become many different cells. You are a byproduct of sexual reproduction. Stability and homeostasis. Uh, all organisms maintain stable internal conditions such as body temperature, water content, etc. And the stable level of internal conditions is called homeostasis. This is probably, in my opinion, the most important thing of all of biology. If I was going to rename the class for biology, I would probably, you know, like there's, you know, you know, Star Wars, A New Hope. Well, if I was going to name biology, I probably would call it biology, the search for homeostasis. Because everything that our, you know, that we do as an organism, we eat, we sleep, we do all these things. Why? To maintain homeostasis in our body, these maintained stable internal conditions 
uh, you know, body temperature, water content. We want to also maintain you know, our cholesterol levels, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, homeostasis is, is very important. Uh, reproduction and inheritance. All organisms reproduce, uh, you know, and they need to reproduce new organisms like themselves. They reproduce if they're a living thing. And they have to have some type of way to get the hereditary material to their offspring. Uh, DNA is a large molecule, and it contains this hereditary material for cells. Now, if you're a unicellular organism, it's a little different, right? Because unicellular organisms have a single loop or a chromosome inside of their cytoplasm. Therefore, uh, they end up, again, being genetic clones of one another. They need to have a very, very simple process for that reproductive mechanism. Uh, multicellular organisms, however, DNA is enclosed inside of a membrane. This is called the nucleus. Uh, inside of that nucleus are chromosomes, and on that chromosome are genes. And genes are short segments of DNA that carry information for a single trait of an organism. The DNA of a cell contains all of the genes and the instructions that we'll ever need. All body cells have a complete set of DNA. So my students sometimes think, like, if you're a heart cell, you know, you don't have all the genetic information of a liver cell, and that is not correct. There is a complete set of DNA. That cell could have just as easily been a liver cell. It could have just as easily been a skin cell. But we go through a process of differentiation in the human organism where we turn on certain, uh, certain DNA genetic information. We'll talk more about that as we move through the class. But, uh, you know, yeah, so like you can see an example here. It says muscle cells have the genes to make thi thyroxine but they don't necessarily use those genes. Again, differentiation determines it. Sexual reproduction, you have an egg, an ovum. It's fertilized by a sperm to form a zygote. So the new organism is made of cells with hereditary information from both parents. In sexual reproduction, however, because they're just copying their DNA and splitting, all cells end up being genetic clones. This guy right here is, is, is Charlie Darwin. Uh, Charlie Darwin, his big thing is evolution. Uh, that populations of organisms change over time or evolve. His mechanism for it is called natural selection or survival of the fittest. It's a process that drives evolution. Organi basically, what he says is that organisms that have favorable traits and are better able to survive and reproduce in their organism or in their environment will survive, will reproduce, and be more what we call fit. We'll talk about fitness later as well. The survival of organisms with these favorable traits causes a gradual change in populations of organisms over many, many generations. This is millions of years. And evolution by natural selection is driven by competition for resources such as food, habitat, and mates. All right, uh, there's another area of, of biology referred to and called ecology. Ecology is basically the, is the study of the interaction of organisms with one another and their environment. And so all organisms are interdependent upon each other. Uh, ultimately, the sun provides all energy for organisms. And so the, the sunlight, which you see down here in this picture, this diagram here, is the provider of energy that the producer will take and fix and make a carbohydrate out of. That carbohydrate will be consumed by just that, a consumer. And then there'll be a consumer that eats that consumer. Called, so we usually call one organism that eats another. We have, so we have herbivores that eat plants. Then we have carnivores that eat other meat, uh, other meat objects. Okay? Uh, and then there's also omnivores, right? Now omnivores are organisms that eat both plants and animals. We have decomposers, and decomposers are responsible for taking those different, uh, the dead organisms, and returning that uh, material to being a usable mechanism for supporting the plant life so that we have that whole circle of life restored. Uh, last thing you see here is you see this word abiotic, right? Anytime we put the term A, the letter A in front of something, such as abiotic, if biotic, if bio means living, biology is the living thing, study of living things, then abiotic must be the non-living factors in the environment, such as air, water, energy, soil, temperature, etc. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. All right, so the opposite, obviously, of abiotic is biotic. Because there's bio at the beginning, it means these are the living things and their uh, impact upon one another. That's the plants, the animals, the fungi, the microorganisms, etc. Uh, they live on something called the biosphere, and the biosphere is, supports life and includes the biotic and the abiotic, all things on the earth. 
Now, organisms respond to their environment, and sometimes they, re they respond in traditional ways. Sometimes they flee, sometimes they adapt, but other times they die off. Uh, most organisms can survive a temporary change, but a permanent change can lead to an extinction. So I have dinosaurs there, right? The, it is hypothesized that there was a large event uh, that caused a, an extended ice age on the planet. And because large dinosaurs could not find an environment, could not find shelter that was conducive to maintaining their body weight, their heat needs, etc., dinosaurs perished from the planet. How do we know they were here? Well, they're here because we can look at the fossil remains and we can look for those types of, uh, that evidence. Uh, there are thousands of species that are listed as endangered. So, you know, for example, you know, if you have bats in your attic, you might find out that bats are endangered. Well, the issue with that then, right, is that if you, you know, wanted to, to get rid of them, then there are all kinds of laws and rules that govern uh, populations that are so small they could be extinct. Um, human interference is a big deal with regards to ecology because we end up doing a lot of things. We pollute the land, the air, the water. We hunt for sport, food, commercial products, etc. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing, but any time that we do that, we end up taking from the population organisms that otherwise would be able to survive and reproduce. Um, clear cutting of rainforests, diverting rivers and lakes, draining wetlands, global warming, etc. Um, so we have some things we've done, like I said, with endangered organisms, and we want to protect them so that we can return their populations to a, to a more successful and a larger population size. A good example of one is the American bison. Um, an Ameri the American bison is, a spe uh, is, is shown above. Um, so a species. Species is a group of organisms so similar to one another they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Pretty important part about being fertile offspring. Uh, so the last thing I would talk about is, okay, you know, we have an impact on our environment. And uh, extinction is a, is a big deal, right? Because whenever we remove a species from an ecosystem, uh, we end up upsetting the balance of nature. And so there's a Pacific yew tree that you see here, and it was endangered. And we have found that uh, the Pacific yew tree contains a chemical that we've been able to use to treat and suppress cancer but it was almost gone off of the planet. So, you know, we talked about there are only 5% of the organisms that we know about on the planet. Well, maybe in that 95% that we don't know about, uh, there are other things like the Pacific yew tree. Uh, matter and organization, well, organisms are highly organized. Uh, they maintain internal order, require constant energy supplies. Why? Because they want to maintain homeostasis. Uh, plants and unicellular organisms with chlorophyll that capture sunlight through photosynthesis, store it in food used by other organisms. And here's our last slide where we talk about, okay, so humans, right? Some of the things that we, you know, get from, from ecology. Number one, we have animal products such as wool, silk, and leather we use to make clothing. Uh, we burn wood, and that provides energy and shelter for us. But, and uh, I guess we don't burn it in that case. But, uh, you know, what can, what can end up happening is through the process of, uh, of doing that, we can endanger other organisms, such as the spotted owl, when we, when we cut forests down. And the last thing is we have, you know, new medicines, better waste treatments, garbage disposal. And these things improve the overall health of our ecosystem and increase the fitness of, uh, of the human organism. So what does that do? That means that hopefully the human organism will be able to survive and reproduce as a species, not as an individual.